Number 10. Andrew Johnson had one of the poorest upbringings of any United States president. His father died when he was only three years old, and his mother supported him and his brother by working as a washerwoman. She did eventually remarry, though her new husband was also poor. The family shared a two-room shack. He never attended school, and his family was called white trash. When speaking of his childhood, Johnson would later say, I have grappled with the gaunt and haggard monster called hunger. Number 9. Johnson was known to have a serious and fervently aggressive temperament. These traits got him into trouble all throughout his life. At 15 years old, there was an incident of Johnson and his friends hurling pieces of wood at a neighbor's home. When the family wanted to sue, Johnson temporarily went on the run. A paper asking for Johnson's capture described him as brooding and forlorn. When he was 26 and serving as mayor of Greenville, Tennessee, he was arrested for assault and battery on another man. As he got older, he would find nonviolent ways to express his aggression, such as becoming a vicious yet very skilled debater. As president, he's been described as obstinate by critics and firm by supportive historians. In any case, Johnson was a fighter, and when he committed to a fight, he didn't give up. It's said that much of this anger was because he never got over being looked down upon as a child. Number 8. The professions of many presidents include planter, military service, and land surveyor. Even James A. Garfield, who also came from extreme poverty, became a lawyer. Johnson was a tailor. He began his apprenticeship at age 10, and would later use this skill to start his own business. Townspeople knew him for his good work and handsome clothes. Later boasting of his work, he said, My work never ripped or gave way. Men would often congregate and discuss matters of importance at Johnson's shop. He used this opportunity to listen and learn. He used the money he made to make investments in real estate. Number 7. Johnson was first elected as Senator of Tennessee in 1857. During the Civil War, Johnson became the sole Southern Senator not to support the Confederacy. He faced heavy ridicule for this and was considered an arch-traitor by the South. However, this move would earn him the support of President Abraham Lincoln, who awarded him with the position of Military Governor of Tennessee. Confederates cut rail lines and destroyed bridges around Nashville, leaving Johnson disconnected and under the threat of being captured. At times, the city had no Union military presence, yet Johnson remained in the capital, providing an example of confidence. One reporter wrote, The coldness and calmness of Andrew Johnson amid these trying times are beyond all praise. Abraham Lincoln described him as invaluable, and later made him his running mate in the election of 1864. Number 6. On April 14, 1865, Abraham Lincoln was assassinated following General Lee's surrender. While Johnson was the third president to assume office upon the previous president's death, he was the first to do so on account of the president being assassinated. Upon learning Lincoln was shot, Johnson was furious. Just earlier that day, he had met with the president for the last time. They discussed Reconstruction, and he warned Lincoln not to go too easy on the South. No doubt after this, he became even more inflamed. A guard assigned to Johnson watched him pace back and forth, repeating, They shall suffer for this. Number 5. The defining issue of Johnson's presidency is his handling of Reconstruction, for which he's been greatly criticized. Initially, Johnson's approach to Reconstruction seemed to be similar to Lincoln's. Despite pressure from Thaddeus Stevens' radical Republicans, he wasn't going to severely punish Southern leaders. However, that didn't mean states could rejoin the Union without making changes. For example, any states looking to rejoin would have to ratify the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery. He also planned to follow through with Lincoln's provisions to help newly freed slaves integrate into regular life. However, within months, Johnson was becoming more lenient on the white Southern elite. He required land given to freed slaves to be returned to its original owners. 
as southern states delayed ratifying the 13th Amendment, re-elected former Confederate leaders, and restricted the rights of blacks, Johnson was passive. Considering the radicals in Congress had already thought Lincoln was too soft on the South, Johnson's handling of the post-war situation was unacceptable. In Washington, Republicans feuded with Johnson, and in the streets, blacks fought against whites. The midterm elections of 1866 saw gains for the Republicans, who now tried to implement their own plans for radical reconstruction. Johnson's methods generally focused on restoring the Union as quickly as possible, while the radicals wanted drastic changes implemented in southern states before they rejoined the Union. For the next two years, he'd continually butt heads with Congress as violence in the nation grew. Number four. As a young adult, Johnson had developed his speaking and debate skills. In the 1840s, rural communities in Tennessee were very isolated, and Johnson was able to use his oratory skills to entertain the people in these remote communities. Hallmarks of his speeches had included boast about his humble beginnings, boast about his skills as a tailor, personal attacks on his opponents, and quotes from the Bible. One of Johnson's early political rivals would later write of Johnson's speaking abilities, quote, He held his crowd spellbound. There was always in his speeches more or less wit, humor, and anecdotes, which relieved them of tedium and heaviness. Decades later, in the summer of 1866, with midterms around the corner, Johnson planned to use his well-established skills to gain support for Reconstruction. He did something unprecedented in presidential history, traveling around the country and giving speeches to the public. However, these crowds were not nearly as receptive. The results were disastrous. He received many hecklers, and in turn, he lashed out against the audience. Hang Jeff Davis, a heckler shouted. Johnson responded, why don't you hang Thad Stevens? Stevens himself referred to Johnson's tour as a circus. Even a supporter of Johnson admitted that the president would have been better if the tour never happened. If anything, he'd helped the Republicans win in the midterms. Number three. In 1867, the radicals pushed the Tenure of Office Act, which made it illegal for the president to remove cabinet members without first consulting Congress. It was essentially a trap set to impeach Johnson. At the time, Johnson was dealing with Lincoln's Secretary of War Edwin Stanton essentially governing the South and doing so in a manner contrary to Johnson's vision. Johnson tested Congress and removed Stanton. Impeachment followed. Eventually, Johnson was acquitted. However, it was only by a single vote. Since then, only two other presidents have been impeached, 42nd President Bill Clinton and 45th Donald Trump. Number two, Johnson's term ended on March 4, 1869, and he returned to Tennessee. Six years later, on January 26, 1875, he was elected senator, making him the first, and as of this recording, the only president to be elected to the Senate after his presidency. He only served in this position for a few months. He suffered two strokes in July of that year, and died shortly afterwards. He was 66. Number 1. Andrew Johnson generally doesn't make the list of most forgettable United States presidents, though, beyond being Abraham Lincoln's successor, few people in the general public are aware of what happened during his administration. Among historians and history enthusiasts, he's generally considered one of the worst presidents for his handling of Reconstruction which has been criticized for its focus on speedy restoration of states to the Union at the expense of civil rights for newly freed slaves. He's also been criticized for making it too easy for southern states to rejoin the Union and not encouraging them to assimilate into post-slavery culture. Critics also point to his character flaws, such as bitterness, obstinance, arrogance, and unwillingness to work with his opposition which not only resulted in a lack of compromise, but also created a divisive spirit in Washington and in the nation. However, 
Others have described him as a stalwart fighter against a radical Congress who were unwilling to accept anything less than the harshest prosecution of the South and drastic leaps in civil rights legislation. His defenders portray him as a flawed but principled man who did the best he could. They also claim that Johnson's enemies had intentionally done everything they could to discredit his legacy and place the blame for the failures of Reconstruction squarely on him. There are many more angles and nuances to historical perceptions on Andrew Johnson, but one thing everyone agrees on is that Reconstruction was a titanic challenge that would have been extremely difficult for any president. In regards to Johnson, Perhaps the most telling statement about him comes from his Secretary of the Treasury. No public man in the United States has ever been so imperfectly understood as Andrew Johnson. None has been so difficult to understand. For more videos like this on other presidents, watch the playlist Presidential 10 Facts. Currently, this playlist only contains a few videos but is being built on over time to contain at least one video like this on each United States president. To support this channel and more uploads like this, consider subscribing and donating to Resyndicated on Patreon. Patreon link in the description below.